start? Sure, you want to start? Yes. All right. Uh, so, hello, Art and Action Lab teens. Um, this isn't, uh, it doesn't go back and forth, so I can't see you. So, hopefully, you're here. Um, we are here at the gallery uh, with Dusty Terry, um, and he's getting ready to start. Um, yeah, I think I'm going to stand it over because he's going to tell you a lot about himself. All right, cool. Huh. So, hi everybody. I'm Dusty Terry. Uh, I'm an industrial designer here in Denver, and um, I work for a company called Link Product Development here in town. And I'm just going to tell you a little bit about what industrial design is, what product development is, as I understand it and as I do it at work, and then a little bit about the circuitous pathway I took to getting myself in school and actually working on things. So. Uh, industrial design is the design process of figuring out form and function of, of built items uh, in our world. Most everything that you've interacted with in your life is uh, a product of an industrial design and product development process. Um, you know, things as, as, as sexy and cool as, as fancy expensive cars um, on down to the stuff you use every day, pens and pencils, flatware, silverware all that kind of stuff. <clears throat> um, you, most of the time it starts with uh, a sketch. You know, everybody has like the, the napkin sketch idea, like that, that cliche. Um, and that's typically how most things start. Industrial design is a lot more than just drawing. Uh, there's a lot of, of observation involved with industrial design. Um, and there's really the, the overarching purpose of industrial design is to solve problems and express ideas. That's what I get to do every day. Uh, it's I don't I don't often draw. I don't often sit at the computer and work on things. I'm usually out in the shop doing stuff or running around visiting sites, uh, helping people out. Um, there's 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 many many aspects of it as I just alluded to. You can be you can be a car designer within industrial design. You can do furniture. A lot of architects have an art uh, industrial design background and vice versa. Uh, and, you know, all those things are pretty mass produced. iPhones, a great example. Uh, Dieter Rams was the first designer of the, the OG iPod with the actual click wheel on it. If any of you are old enough or have seen antiques of those. Uh, and then on the other spectrum, there's lighting design and theater design and uh, special effects design. Um, a lot of a lot of special effects artists have uh, industrial design background and they like myself, have gravitated more toward the the shop side of things and the, the dirty work side of things. So you know you can go you can go build. They, they're called uh, practical assets. So that little gremlin that's in the bottom left corner, you know that's that's a silicone mold model that somebody made up, and it's got armature inside of it. So you can wiggle those arms around and scream and run around. Um, storyboarding for movies when you know they lay out like all the little comic book squares to figure out what's going to go on in each scene. That way they can start figuring out camera blocking and work with the set designers and work with the costume designers. That's all that could fall within your wheelhouse if you decided to go become an industrial designer. Um, so that's really basic broad overview of, of what ID is. Um, so then pertaining to industrial design, product development is what is necessary for an industrial designer to help uh, a, stock, a shareholder or like a stockholder, an interest person comes to you with something to work on and you help go through the product development processes. And product development is the process of bringing an idea from concept all the way to where someone purchases it because it is a product. Uh, let me back up one second. They're also in the, the quickly more and more digital and virtual world that we're all living in. A lot of industrial design is starting to go toward more digital arts, um, you know, uh, user experience design, how you how you navigate through your phone, how websites work. Uh, a lot of that comes down to the creature inputs and, and know-how that industrial designers need to use and pay attention to. So anyway, back to product development. Um, product development is a multidisciplinary effort. There's not, you know, no, no one person does all product development. There's frequently 
a lot of engineering that goes into it. Um, there's definitely a psychological aspect to it. You have to, if you're making a product, you need to appeal to your client, your, your customer base, which you need, to, that's a marketing asset then. You need to know who is going to buy your product and how you aim your product, both physically and emotionally at your client so that they, they want to purchase your product. Um, and that's, again, you can break that into psychology. Color theory plays a lot in the product development. Um, you know, if, if, if you're trying to make something that people are gonna eat off of, you wouldn't wanna use an, an unappetizing color. And that actually changes country to country but, and uh, uh, even within generations, some of those values and norms change. So it's, it's necessary for product developers to be constantly immersing themselves in what's going on around them. Um, you know, it's the, the, you know, the, the old saying, a rolling stone gathers no moss. If you're not, if you're not doing stuff, you're gonna get stagnant and you're not gonna know what else is going on in the, the greater environment around you. And then you'll then be designing for people that were purchasing things when you stopped caring about what was going on outside of you. So you have to stay connected and, and running around and thinking about things. So the company I work with is called Link Product Development. And basically, we are a full service engineering and design studio. So a client will come to us. Sometimes their idea is a napkin sketch or just not even that much. They just have like, oh, I got this great idea. You got to hear about this. And then we come in and sit down and talk with them. And then we work through what steps they need to get to to get you know, up to manufacturing and, and, and then beyond manufacturing. Like just getting your, just getting your product made is not you know, the end of the line. You also have to figure out your marketing aspect, how your, what your path to market is, how you're gonna package it, how you're gonna ship it. All those headaches all come into product development. Um, and again, it's, it's a lot of problem solving. We've had, we've had clients come in that they just are having a material issue and it, it could be something that was poorly engineered or it could be that the, the wrong material was selected for uh, what's going on here. This, the, the password just popped up on here. I don't know if we're <laughs> And we're having trouble oh, with this one too. Oh, cool. it, just, it just went away. Awesome, so, sorry. <laughs> uh, sorry, sorry about that. Um, so yeah, so we've had clients come in and you know they've had one uh, one component of their product is, is failing and they, they ask us to help figure out what's going on. So at that point, we have to become almost as knowledgeable about their product as as they are so we've gotten to go do all kinds of fun field exercises where we go you know we've, we work with dentists and surgeons and we've actually gotten to go to surgical theaters and observe surgeons doing their job and observe dentists doing their job that way we understand you know how they're moving their body when they're using parts what the you know in, in the case of surgery how they're how they're laying the patient out and what's going on and so we try to look at ergonomic impacts and, and lessen the impact of doing their job on them or of, of their client doing their job. Um, so I'll just pop into one of the projects that we completed recently. So make this, there we go. So this company is a Denver-based company called Vivo Blue, and their mission is to get uh, clean water to some of the two billion people on Earth that don't have access to it, and it's it's a tough job you know you go to sub-saharan africa or thailand or rwanda places like that there's not a lot of infrastructure there's not a lot of roads there's not a lot of people that have cars so when the family has to walk two miles to the river to get a bucket of water to bring it back to the house to boil it you know think of how much water you use in a day even if you're not doing dishes laundry and, and running showers it's that's a lot and that that takes a lot of time out of that family's life and it takes a lot of their ability to make themselves better like you know, mom and dad can both be working or helping the kids out, uh, letting the kids even have the ability to be able to go away from the family for a day to go to school rather than just sitting and helping generate water. So this, this device is about six inches long and it's just a little plastic filtration system. And when they came to us, they had, uh, they had just the, the filter material itself and they wanted a way that we could package it so that it could be cleaned safely, but that it would all snap into itself so that when you're laying parts out, you don't have anything actually come all the way apart. So if you set it down, you can't lose it. Uh, also, in, in a lot of third world countries and poorer communities, if you can disassemble something all the, all the way to, to, to service it or to clean it, uh, they feel like it's, it's broken at that point because it's in so many pieces. So we had to 
worry about being able to clean it, but make it simple enough that it wasn't like you had to have a, an array laid out of what O-ring went where. And the way it works is just, it's a, a capillary filter that filters everything that can hurt you out down to, down to one micron of size. So that's, what's that one, one millionth of an inch? Oh, yeah. Hang on. <laughs> so many technical difficulties. I apologize. <laughs> I think we just need to, there we go. Wow. Okay, good. Right. Thank you. Where to stop at? <laughs> You're doing great. Okay. Like doing uh, so yeah, so this thing, it'll it'll filter everything out of out of the water that you're going to drink, except for some nasty viruses, which don't occur in too many places. Um, that was that was one of the design parameters that we had. Another design parameter that we had was it had to filter passively. We didn't they didn't want anything that you had to sit there and pump or or be babysitting it because then you can just dump water in it, come back and. 45 minutes to an hour and have several gallons of water that you can use. So we had to worry about the head pressure on the filter, how it was working, you know, just all, all kinds of um, laminar flow rate things, so like a, a whole lot of engineering that's way over my head. Uh, and we also had to worry about keeping the, the price of this thing below $3 once it was manufactured because the non-government organizations that were purchasing it to disperse in the countries they go use it, their, lip, their hard stop was $2.75. So we had to worry about what material we were gonna select, not only for worrying about it laying in the water, because there's certain plastics that'll absorb water and they swell and break and get soft, or they, they let plastics out. And we certainly don't wanna be putting more plastics into these people's food chain already than there are already there. So we had to worry about that, but we also had to keep cost in mind. And we wound up getting this thing made and it's it lands for uh, $2.00. And, 25 or two dollars and 28 cents or something like that um and it'll we intended it to just take care of a family of four for their water needs for a day and now that they're out in the field and our client has come back a few times and let us know how it's doing which is always really nice when clients come back and talk to you because it means you did an okay job but uh he said that frequently what goes on is they they'll set this up and four families will use it and they get all their water needs met by it and all they got to do they can just use discharge hose off of irrigation or whatever and throw it in there. You can dump this with muddy water straight out of the plat and you'd be able to drink it. Um, I don't know how it would taste, but it's it's drinkable. <laughs> and so that was, that was uh, a, a pretty sizable challenge. And another aspect of this product was we didn't want there to be a ton of packaging to have to throw away. So we developed just like an easy, quick, easy Ziploc bag for it. But then you, if you see at the bottom of the illustration here, there's, um, it, it takes two buckets. So that's the, that's the only thing besides the water that the end user has to supply is these two buckets. But we had to figure out a way to express the instructions in a country where most people don't read and write their own language, let alone English. So we just did a bunch of infographics and then had people come use it blind and see if they could figure out how to get the hole poked in the bucket and, and get it all set up. So there's there's many, many issues to concern when you're doing product development. And this one was was really fun, but it was also kind of difficult because typically we work designing a consumer product, something that people are going to want to get and want to go out and buy, and they're going to want to educate themselves about it. And with this product, it's something people that, that they need, but they're not, you know, they don't have the internet, they're not out actively searching for it. So we had to just take all of the mystery that sometimes is is uh, intentionally designed into a product because it's it's fun when you get something new that you kind of discover like a new way that your pocket knife opens or some way that you can you know uh, back to user experience a new a new way you can use your phone to to take pictures or set a timer or any of that kind of thing so it was it was a pretty challenging project and it was a, you know again a lot of problem solving and, and just a lot of fun so next here it still looks really nice couldn't help Pardon me. It still looks really nice, though. Like you couldn't help yourself. Yeah, I mean, we <laughs> can't just you can't just throw bricks out there. So, uh, so here's on this page is a, a a collection of a few other projects we've done. In the top left corner over here, this is a local company called Lucy Mobility, and it's clearly a, a power chair. Uh, which if you know what a power chair is, it's just a, a wheelchair that has its own propulsion on it. You can you can drive it with a joystick if you have that much mobility. There are people that have just a, a little uh, blight, a bite and blow tube to get around. Um, but the, the thing with power chairs is they are very, very heavy so that they're more stable and they are not the easiest thing to drive even if you're a fully mobile person. 
So the little uh, black array, you can see like these little black bits and, and that plate around the base there. That's that's the part that Lucy had us help them develop. And it is basically a radar array for a power chair. So it won't let you run your chair off a curb. It won't let you run over your friend's feet. It won't let you run into tables. And Lucy's uh, mission started, the owner and the co-owner, it's a, a it's two brothers, and the owner's daughter was born with uh, cerebral palsy, and she's going to be chair bound for her entire life. And he saw just the 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 quality of life that a lot, a lot of people have had with cerebral palsy. And you have to have someone running around. You got to be really careful about tipping your chair or going out, like being able to be autonomous. And he didn't he didn't want his daughter to have to worry about that stuff as much. So they they started figuring out this radar array for the chair, and they came to us to help work on a bunch of it and that so that was a great project we got to go to their facility which is another great thing about product development and being a designer or an engineer or a developer is you get to go do all kinds of different things all the time there's always always new stuff going on there's always something to learn there's always humbling things going on like we all cried about five times working on this project it's just it's hard not to get emotional when you get to help people out it's it's really nice um and again they're they're denver based and you know they're really they're really pushing to get this done i mean chairs have been around for a long time this kind of radar has been at that size for at least 10 years and just nobody had thought about doing it yet because nobody had thought that you could so they're a, a market leader with that for sure to the right of it is a surgical device that we just recently had hit market and it is um, an abdominal retractor so the thing is about eight inches long by four inches wide to give you some scale there. Uh, and it's all made out of titanium, weighs about two and a half pounds. And its entire purpose is to allow rapid access in trauma surgeries. The surgeon that developed it is an ex-Special Forces medic, and he now teaches at a military hospital in Texas. And he has frequently got to deal with auto accidents and gunshots. And if you don't have retraction quickly, like if you can't get down to what's hurt quickly, people bleed to death in a hurry. So the, the two items that were on market that, that exist, one of them took about 15 minutes to set up, but it gave you great exposure. The other one, it was just a handheld device and you could just put it in the wound and open real quick, but it didn't, it only, it only opened up about that big. So then he was just running blind working on people. So he'd been developing this thing. When we got contracted to help them out, he had several prototypes that were not working at all. The mechanism was completely different. It was cumbersome and heavy. And we made about, I don't know, I would say 40 different prototypes trying to get it get it dialed in. And once we finally had one that we liked, we got to go to a lab in Texas and assist in a cadaver exercise where we got to see how the device worked. And myself and one of our engineers went down there and we actually got to assist in the mock surgery that the, the surgeon was doing, which was a little smelly and weird, but it was also, I mean, I'm, I'm never, I'm never going to go to med school. So getting the chance to do something like that is pretty unique. And it was, it was pretty exciting, but this thing has hit market now and there's uh, professionals all over the country that are calling this company is called ASR or it's called Titan and they're calling in to Titan wanting this product. I mean, it's, it's great. Now what's going on along with the product development side of it, you got to get things manufactured. And we found a local manufacturer that's, a, it's a machine shop. They've got parts on Mars. They build space shuttle parts. They build race car parts. They do stuff for Coors Tech. Um, but they're having a hard time keeping consistency with how everything slides and how it all feels. So two or three times a week, we go down to that manufacturer and we have engineering meetings and we, we get out little tiny calipers and we just, we're trying to figure out every aspect of what's going on with this thing. And it's way more in depth into any product than I have ever been. And it's it's been it's been very interesting learning learning how working with engineers, like all the stuff that they are concerned about and look at is all all numbers and letters and, and some equation that they're working in. But that all directly translates to the way this product looks and feels because all those minute details matter and you gotta leave room for certain components to fit within other ones and that pushes materials around. So anyway, that has been <laughs> a, a quite exciting project. Another one we just did is this uh, alarm clock here in the bottom left corner. And this is from a company called One Clock. And it was a group of uh, local guys that they just, they were, you know, a lot, of, a lot of people in the working universe experience insomnia pretty regularly and they have a hard time 
shutting their phones off or just just disconnecting at night. So this this is a more like you know grandparents and parents alarm clock. All it does is tell you the time and plays a song, but it's got um, artificial intelligence inside of it. There's I think ten seed songs. And every time the song plays, the AI makes the song progress a different way and it actually composes its own music. So you never have the same alarm clock song twice with this thing. And when you're sleeping at night, if you want to know what time it is, instead of picking your phone up and seeing like, oh, I've got a meeting at seven and I got to do this and I got to do that. You can just tap the top of that alarm clock and it, the light glows up and you can see what time it is. And then it kind of glows back down and you can just hopefully just fall right back asleep. Uh, when they came to us with this, they had a, a rough idea of what they wanted it to look like. So we, you know, we kind of started with a, a rectangular shape and we were in charge of figuring out the wall thickness on the, the housing surround, all of the colors. The color selection on this was really fun because we had the, you know, we really wanted to push the color with it, but it's it's also supposed to be something that you put in your bedroom that's it's kind of soothing and calming. So we got to play around with, with, with pushing pastels to the point where they're nice to look at. They're not just Easter egg colors. So we got to do a lot of color wheel play and a lot of paint mixing. Uh, we were in charge of how the, the knob felt, like there's a click on the knob and that little detent, you know, if you ever play with car stereos, some of them got like a really light, quick spin on the knob and some of them have like a nice heavy twist. And that's never an accident when you're out, when you're out in the world turning a doorknob, like how some doorknobs are just all floppy, like a, a piece of chicken wing hanging off. And some of them have a nice hard click and some of them kind of great. All of that is intentional, and if it's not intentional, if they, you know, if they left it up to the to chance during the manufacturing process, then they're just lucky if something feels good. All of, all of those things are are thought out and, and sought after. Um, so after we had this thing all dialed in, we made several pretty pretty high level prototypes. Um, then they they launched a Kickstarter with with all of the assets that we generated. So we we did a bunch of sketches, a whole bunch of renderings. All the control drawings in, in SolidWorks so that this thing could be machined and actually made. And then they had a successful Kickstarter based off of it. Units are shipped and uh, people are using them in their homes. And the Museum of Modern Art has selected this to be one of their permanent items in their gift shop. They can go by because they, they like the shape of it and the look of it so much, which is pretty neat. I never thought that would be anything that I had a part of in my fingers in happening to it. And then the last one on this page on the bottom right is a carbon fiber mountain bike frame that we designed for a local company called Gorilla Gravity. They had started their business off and they were just uh, aluminum frames only. Everything they welded in-house, they did all their tubing bending in-house, and they had a really core following of their clients that, you know, really, really appreciated what they did. They did it all themselves. The bikes were made in the U.S., and they didn't make excuses about any of it. And they also weren't doing the carbon fiber game, which a lot of bike companies have started making only carbon fiber bikes, which quickly prices out most people that want to just have a fun dirt bike, dirty bike to go beat on in the woods. And nobody makes carbon fiber bikes in America, except for these guys. Uh, they used some technology that I believe Boeing developed. So it, it changed the layup process for the carbon fiber. So it's far less laborious. Uh, but when they came to us, they originally just wanted some concept sketches because they wanted to make sure that the feel of this new bike wasn't so far away from their old bike that they would alienate more clientele. So we did rounds and rounds of sketching. Uh, I, I think we probably generated two or 300 different frame designs. And you know, a lot of it was just moving a little angle here or changing the, changing the chamfer here or there. But it was it was a pretty exhaustive process. And then the further we got into it, the more the more they started trusting us with their vision. So we wound up doing um, a bunch of prototyping. So I'm just going to skip to the next page. So the top left here, we actually 3D printed a full size frame of several of the designs that they liked. And then we built the bike up with all the components so that we could see in meat space, like in the real world, to make sure that everything was proportional with it, because frequently when you're doing everything on your computer screen and working in SolidWorks or Illustrator, you know, you know the measurements that are on the screen. It says something's two inches by six inches. But then when you get that piece out in the real world after someone's made it, you're like, oh, that's uh, that's way too big. That's way too small. So you always kind of got to do a, a reality check on your on your items. Uh, so that was that was part of the process, building stuff up with them over to the right. The, the right top two and, and the bottom. Uh, this was another client of ours that we helped him develop uh it's not even a, a it's just a, a dental assist tool so it's just basically a little well that fits on the back of your rubber gloves so he has two little 
whole two little divots to keep some of the polishing compound that they use when they're cleaning your teeth. And then it's got a spot to hold some of the little scraper tools they use. And then the center of it just holds gauze. And when uh, this is Dr. Dr. Jack, when Jack first came in, he had, you know, a little rough sketch of his own that he had built this little strap and he had like a piece of cardboard. He's like, yeah, I think you can just put it on like a glove and you can work with it. So we went to his dental office and this guy on the right is one of our old interns. Um, he got a teeth cleaning and we just got to sit there and watch what went on. And we, we videotaped it from several angles and just took notes and paid attention to, you know, we call it pain points. So when you're working with something and there's like that little thing that annoys you, but like, oh, it's not a big deal. We try to take all that not a big deal out so that you just have smooth sailing for everything. So we paid attention to all that and we realized that the strap going across Dr. Jack's palm was was just getting in his way. So that's when we went back to the office. We were watching the video and talking about all of our observations. And so this picture up here, a lot of times we'll do what we call Frankenstein modeling or sketch modeling. So we'll just take some cardboard or paper or whatever you got laying around and start messing around with three dimensional form, but just quick and dirty and quick and easy. And we figured out like, oh yeah, you could just make this little kind of paper airplane deal and put it on the back of your hand. If it's sticky, you got everything you need right there. You don't have to have a strap. You know, the whole, like we're all trying to get away from designing throwaway stuff, but certain things make sense. Like this thing is uh, less than half a millimeter thick. And I think they cost a third of a cent a piece at production level now. And he can just slap that on there, use it and put it in the recycling bin. And it can just, it can just go away. But so a lot of times, like some of the processes we use is what this, this page is all about. So this, this is rough sketch modeling, Frankenstein modeling over here on the bottom left. Um, you see some, some actual sketches. This is for that surgical device that was on the other page. And after we had some sketches put out to the point where we, we, cause we're trying to understand the problem we were working on again, problem solving. Once we figured, figured out like, okay, we think this is going to work. Then we moved into 3d printing and we 3d printed a bunch of the parts rather than paying a machinist to make them out of titanium or steel. So you can just get a good low level check that everything's going to work. So that's, that's some of the processes that we use at work. Mostly what I do in my job, like I said, I don't do a whole lot of sketching. I don't do a whole lot of illustrator or Photoshop computer time. I do a lot of the physical side of things. And I, I make sure that designs work and that they're sound. I do, I do a quick gut check on some engineering, um, no math calcs or anything like that, but just like, is this, does this make sense? Can we actually, can we actually build it? Cause there's a lot of things you can design that you can't reliably build. Um, you know, uh, square corners inside of pieces, they're going to be machined. You can't machine a square internal corner from w only one dimension. You got to be able to pop out of it. And if it's, if it's a pocket, you can't get in there to do it. So there's a thing within industrial design and engineering that's called design for manufacturing. And that's a lot of what I do is we look at what process we're going to use to build an item. If it's injection molding, which injection molding is basically you have uh, a cavity mold that clamps together real hard and then they inject molten plastic into it and it sits there long enough that it cools down and solidifies and opens up, pops the part out, slams back shut and they squirt more plastic in. And you can make hundreds of thousands of parts with that and they're all exactly the same. That's how most of the plastic housings, like if you have a plastic housing on your phone or just looking around here, all these microphones and everything around me, all of those housings are most likely injection molded. Uh, and there's different design parameters that you have to adhere to for injection molding versus machining. And the same object, you could you could dip, sketch it and draw it the same way and it looks the same, but if it's made out of metal versus being made out of plastic, they have to be a different process and those processes require the attention of a designer and an engineer to make them work. So then that's, that's what I do at work um, and who I work for. So now the point of me being asked here today was to talk about the winding pathway that I took getting here. And I was definitely not a traditional student. I grew up in rural Wyoming, the whole state's rural. I grew, up, I grew up in the middle of nowhere in Wyoming. And um, I wasn't a, a great student. Um, I wasn't particularly engaged with school. It just never really interested me a whole lot. Uh, I'd rather have been outside skateboarding or playing music with my friends or just any kind of horse and off other than being in school. And so I took, I took a long time to get, to get figured out what I wanted to be when I grew up and I'm, I'm 43 and I still don't know what I want to be when I grow up. So I'm still working on that, but I had a lot of different jobs on the way and they've all, they've all informed what I do for a living and how I do what I do. 
at, at points in my life, I've been a wildland firefighter and that, that taught me that, you know, no matter how hard things get at work, you can't give up. You know, wild, firefighting, if you give up, the forest is going to burn down, you're going to get burned over, like you have to keep going until you're done. And that translates straight into so many of the projects that we get. We'll get a, we'll get a, just a, a stopped problem and you'll spend, I mean, I've spent weeks working on problems at work before trying different inputs, getting different outputs, but still just failing, 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 failing. And then when it finally works, you think, man, that is the dumbest thing. How did I not see that? But all answers are obvious once they're in your face. It's just hunting them down. It's the hard part. So I did, I, you know, I was a wildland firefighter. I was a, a roughneck up in Wyoming, which roughnecks is a colloquial term for uh, oil and gas workers. So I, would, I used to drill for a natural gas up in Wyoming. And that by far is the most dangerous job I've ever had. Um, I saw some people get hurt pretty bad. I don't have any of my own top front teeth because I got smashed in the face with a big pipe when I was at work. And that really taught me that no matter what safety practices are in place, no matter what OSHA says, no matter what your boss says about what's safety, it's up to you to look out for yourself. Make sure that you got the right protective equipment. Make sure that you know what's going on around you. And again, that comes back to observation. Just like going to a, a work site and seeing what your client's doing for their product. You know, I work in the shop a lot. I work around a lot of sharp stuff, a lot of hot stuff. And, you know, I, I weld frequently. I machine things. Like I could lose fingers most days at work. And you got to really just be paying attention to what you're getting into and what you're doing. And that level of, of intimacy with your project, like you're, you're paying attention to what you're doing. And a lot of times you can catch problems before they occur or as they occur. And you can look at a part, like say you're machining something, you can pull a part off of a mill and you can interpret what's going on with the part that you're cutting by what the, the cut material looks like and what, what's left over looks like. You can tell tool chatter if you're moving too fast, if you're moving too slow, if you're burning up parts, there's a lot of it you can, you can learn just by observing. Um, I've, I had a, I have a psychology degree. Uh, that was a job I had for a while. Uh, and that taught me a lot about the human factor side of, of design. You know, we're all, we're all creatures. We all desire things. We all like things. We all dislike things. And a lot of the frustration that comes in the product universe is expectation not being met. So if you have a product that you say it's going to do X, Y, or Z, and it doesn't do those things, or it does them poorly, or if you have a product that does those things, but the, the market that you're selling to is a, a type of market that have a higher expectation than what you can meet, you're going to have disappointment. You're going to have clients upset. You're going to have people returning your product. You're going to have people smashing your product and then bashing you on social media or out in the streets. Uh, so it's, it, it helps me a lot at work because I can, I can sit with clients and talk with them and it helps in meetings and, and just in general, like you can, you can read body language pretty well and not that any one of us cannot do that, but it, it, it helped me have the language to express that. And I, I talk with my colleagues and my teammates at work about, you know, we'll, we'll sometimes we'll be talking with, with clients about projects and we have, we also have, you know, a lot of clients that they, they come to us and their their invention is their baby. You know, it's, it's this very, very personal thing. And it's nobody wants to hear that their baby's ugly. So when you tell somebody their idea, you're not just gonna be like, that's a bad idea because you're just going to alienate the people that are around you. There's you got to have tact. And you can also tell like if you're if you're starting to like touch a nerve with people or not. And it just that that helps that understanding. And I've been a, a bicycle mechanic. I used to race uh, privateer downhill for quite a while. And that was actually one of the first things that made me appreciate mechanics and, and started kind of guiding me toward industrial design. Because as I was riding these bikes, they need maintenance all the time. And, you know, you can just start twisting wrenches and pull stuff apart and really trash things out. And I did that a few times for sure, because I learned that fire is hot by putting my hand in it. But uh, it really made me appreciate all the thought that went into how all these assemblies were put together. And then that made me seek out like, okay, well, how do you make this stuff? You know, you got to pack an O-ring into an orifice. How do you know that that O-ring is not too tight or not too loose? So it'll keep oil out or in, but that it won't, you know, not let your fork cycle or, you know, whatever, like how your, how your car just runs for hundreds of thousands of miles needing only a, a minimum of maintenance versus even 50 years ago, you had to adjust your valves and, and take care of a lot more stuff. And there's a whole theological argument about is it good that we don't have to maintain our own things that we won't get into today but uh 
yeah, so I, I was all over the place when, when I was younger. Uh, I, I did community college when I was right out of high school because I thought I had to go to college because that's what my folks wanted me to do. And I was the first person in my family to go to college. So it was important to them that I went. And when I got there, that's, that's when I went and got my psychology degree. I just, I didn't, none of it felt real to me because it wasn't really what I wanted to do. And I was still kind of lost. And then, so that's when I went and was a firefighter and was a roughneck. And I, you know, I've built houses. I've just, I, I bounced around and did a lot of, a lot of different things because I'd never found anything that really spoke to me. And then when I finally learned about industrial design, that really was like, oh man, I, I can, I can sit and think and I get paid to think and like take my time and really care about something and like draw and work on things. And then I can also have days where I get to go build stuff. Cause that's, that's where I feel the most creative and excited is when I'm actually building things. A lot of times in the shop at work, I'll just be doing stuff on the fly and kind of taking notes so that when we have to go back and recreate what I just concocted in CAD, you know, you need to have measurements and what worked and what didn't, but that's where, that's where I really feel like a creative person is when I get to be in the shop and work on things and, and work with my teammates to solve problems. And we, we bounce back and forth off of each other. And a lot of times it takes two or three brains getting on a, a problem where then you go, oh, aha, that's, that's what we've been missing. And that was something that, you know, when I was in school, I always hated group projects because you always have to worry about, you know, somebody not doing their job, somebody not taking care of their stuff, somebody's out sick, whatever. And it's, you know, once a semester when you're, well, at least when I was in school, it was about once a semester per class where we had a group project, nobody works alone. So embrace group projects if you do go to school and use, use those challenges when you have a classmate that's just dragging their feet and not doing much, try to excite them, you know, see why they're, see why they're not interested in what's going on. And the same can work with clients. And when we have clients frequently, it's insane because it's not cheap working with anyone outside help and it's it's pulling teeth to get them to come in and and actually engage in projects and a lot of times that boils down to you know they feel out of their element or a little uncomfortable or a little intimidated and it's it's a hard thing to express that as especially as a business person because you're expected to know everything and you're expected to lead the way and if you're like ah man i kind of got doubts about this or i really don't know i really don't know the words that you're using like those are hard questions to ask until you ask them or until someone asks that of you. So, yeah. So I think that's, I think that's a quick nutshell about Dusty Terry. So hopefully some of it made sense. Yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah, I think that's great. And I think you really covered uh, so many aspects, right? With the, the interpersonal as well as the thinking. Yeah, I think, yeah. and I, I may be a little more touchy feely than, than other designers, but I think that you can't have good product design, good product development without understanding who it's for. And you gotta just like dive in and ask questions and be be vulnerable. And you know, I, I, I've done a lot of different stuff in my life leading up to this. And I, the reason that occurred is because I just, I said yes to a lot of different things. And I think that that's an important thing to do is just, you know, if, if you're living in, if you've never been in the country before and you have friends that are from a rural state, like when you go away to school or when you're visiting in the summertime, you know, go out and do stuff that's not what you do every day and, and go be observant. Everything you do, be observant. It only makes you better at talking to the person next to you or understanding someone else that's not coming from the same place you are. You know, it's like if you're trying to speak with someone that doesn't speak English or, you know, doesn't speak a whole lot of English, it's always like once you get talking with each other, it's always fun and, you know, you, you help the other person along and you laugh when you make mistakes. And that's that's the same way in design and in engineering. Hopefully you don't make too many mistakes, but hopefully you you have a good rapport and um, observation of what's going on, so you can speak to one another and you can help one another get past the point that you can't get past. All right, I think Allison, you're ready. All right. Um, I'm gonna let you change the camera. Hi. Hi. How's it going? Good. I'm Allison. I'm Dusty. <laughs> That was great. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, so yeah, I'm here on behalf of our high school interns okay. um, to just ask you some questions like from their perspective, if they're interested in pursuing this career. Um, and first, like we've gone over some of your like most memorable projects. Um, that surgical device was really amazing. Um, 
on like a typical work day, like yesterday or today? Like what usually is the routine for you? Uh, so our shop is pretty laid back uh, versus a lot of other larger commercial outfits. There's only six of us. We have three engineers and three designers. We work four tens. So we always have Friday, Saturday, Sunday off unless there's something heavy going on that we got to take care of. But typically get in in the morning, on Monday mornings, we do a team meeting and, and go through all the projects we've got to do and everybody kind of gets their their quick to go list. And then so uh, today is a good example. I came in today and sat down and just sketched on a whole bunch of uh, concepts for clients that we had coming in this afternoon and then prepped the conference room for those clients being there. And then once the clients got there, I, I pivoted to another project and started working on some stuff in our shop, like doing some equipment maintenance and doing some tool setup. Typical days are not typical, is what I would say. We do we do pretty different stuff every day. I mean, it's all under the same discipline, but it's we at any time we've got six clients that we're working with, six to ten, um, and it just it depends on what needs done. Sometimes I'm just running parts uh, on the on the mill or on the CNC machine. Sometimes I'm actually delivering parts to clients. Sometimes I got to go paint stuff. It just, it, nice. yeah. So just whatever needs done is a typical day. <laughs> yeah, that's great. It's always a surprise. Yeah. So and you get Fridays. It's yeah. Great. <laughs> get Friday, yeah. Fridays, Fridays always overflow. So if we don't get something done during the week that we promised mm -hmm. on Monday, like we can come in and get it taken care of. Okay. And a lot of times too, we do, like we've done, um, you know, we had you all in this summer and did, did a quick design charrette and kind of did, gave like a really reader's digest condensed version of product development. So we, we typically do that on Fridays. That way it doesn't cut into the productivity at work, but we still really want to help out and, and give back. So like tomorrow I have a, a student coming and he's just going to have kind of a private tour of the shop because he's interested in industrial design. So he's coming in with one of his teachers and, you know, I've got two hours blocked off to show him around and, and talk. So that, that happens not super regularly, but it's been, it's been going on more and more. So that's, that's been cool too. So yeah, a typical day is atypical. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. So yeah, um, if you like, uh, you know, like a set schedule, you know what you're doing every day, all day. Yeah. It might not be the universe, but also again, that's our shop's kind of unique because we we all have to wear a whole bunch of hats and do a bunch of different things. So. Yeah, and we're all creative types here, so yeah. Um, that sounds like pretty exciting overall. Uh, a lot of different projects. Yeah. That's how I work. Um, so you talked about um, your love of biking and how that kind of led you into understanding um, design and industrial design. Um, and you have like worn a lot of hats before that. Um, did you kind of have to go back to school and like continue education in order to get this industrial design job that you have? So uh, no, so I, I, I came down to Denver specifically go to go to school for industrial design. And then so, going to college for anything, they teach you just enough to be dangerous and then tell you to go get a job. So there's a lot of on the job training. I've been working with the outfit I've been, I'm at now for 10 years and I am still constantly learning. So besides everything being different all the time, I get to learn all uh, frequently. If there's, if, if there's new software coming online or if we get a new piece of equipment, I, I get to go get training on that. Uh, on top of, you know, a lot on my own time when we get new clients in and I don't know anything about their field, I'll at home, I'll sit and, and research and, and try to learn what they're, you know, working with doctors, they use a lot of words I've never heard before. Mm -hmm. So I just kind of go sit and like research terminology and understand that, okay, this guy's a trauma surgeon. What, what does that entail? You know, yeah. understand that. So I didn't have to go back to school to get my job. Um, I had already gone. I will also okay. say that I, I, I could have gotten my job without the schooling that I went to for, for what I do because um, I already kind of knew how to do it. And I going to school definitely got, got me that job. But, you know, when you when you go apply at a lot of places it's like, oh, we need an industrial designer type one. Like, well, what does that mean? That's that's, you know, uh, a bachelor equivalent of experience. So if you have experience in the field, you know, if you want to go. You know, you can you can take like industrial design classes on YouTube and sit and you just you just have to be the one that rides your own back to to do all the sketching you've got to do. And you have to seek someone out to critique your work and understand like what's what's adequate and what's inadequate, you know, what's good or bad, whatever. Um, school is uh, not a concrete pathway to a job. 
but it is it is like a line of sight pathway to a job. Like once you're graduated with that degree, if your portfolio is commanding enough, you can walk in somewhere and like, here's what I can do. Like that's my credentials at that point. And so like we look often at interns that come in and it's we we want to bring them in to educate them, but we also want to bring someone in that's at a level that we can we can use their skills because mm -hmm. we're helping them. They, they're going to help us. And if we get somebody, you know, you can you can look at 10 kids that are in the same program and there's going to be 10 different levels of aptitude. And we aren't always looking for just the highest aptitude person. Attitude matters a whole bunch. Um, I'm getting off track on, on the, the schooling question, but it's it's a it's a lot of what you put into it. So. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, it does. The next question I was asking was about um, personal qualities, abilities that are important for this job. And I think that you're kind of answering that. Um, you talked about like staying on top of your work um, and just like keeping good track of your own projects. Um, I like what you're saying about attitude. Like that's an important question because you know you did get this bachelor's degree, but there are other more important skills mm -hmm. you're saying. Um, yeah, like we one of the main things that we look at when you know, uh, we're looking at a new hire is accountability for sure. And they've got to be able to get along with the rest of us that are at work because mm -hmm. we're all we're all a team and we all, you know, we don't all have we don't have our own offices. We all just have our desks and, you know, run past each other, talk to each other. A lot of times if there's, you know, a uh, six projects going on, a couple of people run a project and we just check in with each other. Like, okay, well, we're doing this. Like, does this seem like it's a good idea? The so design. being able to the, the design and the engineering. So, so being able to get along interpersonally, and that doesn't mean like we all have to be good friends, but you know, it's just like anywhere else in life. There's someone that drives you crazy. You can't just go hit them in the face or yell at them. Like, you gotta, you gotta find common ground and have a way to work together. And hopefully the company you work at isn't hiring people that their personalities are completely divergent from the people that you're working with. Yeah, and the design kind of happens like around a table. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's there's, great. yeah, there's not a whole lot of design by committee, but yeah, that goes on. And then not having a huge ego either. I mean, doing doing design and engineering, you know, there's there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of ego in product development and in, in business. Mm -hmm. And then if, if you're cranking out designs for people and you got something that your heart's just set on and they don't like it, that can't you can't let that hurt your feelings. You know, just if people are being critical, take that as a you know, hopefully you can take that as a way to to, okay, well, I want to learn what they want, what they like. And you get better, not at designing what they want, but you get better at design because you have a broader reference point at that point. Great. Um, so how do you measure success for yourself in this career? Like, what do you find? Um, uh, I feel like I can kind of relate this to this other question about what you find most satisfying um, in this career and most challenging? And then how do you, um, what are your goals that would make you feel successful as you keep going? So I think that measuring success, hopefully for everyone, is just fulfillment and happiness. You know, you can get paid all the money in the world and have time off and, and all that, but if you're just bummed when you go to work, you know, you're, yeah. you're not happy, you're just, you know, you're doing, I gotta go make the donuts. And it's just, it's not great. So success and, and in my mind, like success is being challenged every day and having having the the you know your your boss trusts you or your supervisors whatever like they trust they trust you to fail better. We we fail all the time at work. You know, get stuff wrong. Nothing ever works the first try. Um, but we know that and we understand that. And even when there's a lot of pressure on because it's it's a low t uh, a tight time frame project, it's you're like oh yeah, screw it up. Okay, well what do we learn from that? And that that constant learning and self-reliance like that's that makes me feel successful mm -hmm. and i get to be creative and solve problems and when when i actually do solve a problem or when i'm part of like the group of us that solves a problem it feels really good and that's that's when i feel successful days and weeks when we're you know like i was talking earlier about just beating our heads against problems with projects when that stuff's going on like those days you kind of go home kicking rocks and you're not the most excited about it but that just makes it feel so much better when you do get it right. And you know there's a solution out there somewhere. Sometimes the solution that you find is still not the right one because it costs too much or it takes too long to make it or it's just too too handcrafty. You know, there's a lot of stuff you can do design-wise where you're like, oh, this works. I just got to buy all this little piece out in manufacturing. But nobody's going to pay somebody to sit there with a file and, and file that part out because 
their 20 minutes of work is going to cost more than the entire rest of the production scheme. Mm -hmm. So then what was the second one about? Oh, um, well, we were talking about like what's satisfying for you and you're talking about yeah. solving problems, yeah. uh, getting new problems every day. Yeah. Um, yeah. Not doing the same thing over and over. I could not be a factory worker. I've been a production welder before a little bit and just done, done the same thing like 300 times and you get really good at that little bit, but it, man, it's mindless and it just, you yeah. have all that time. Like once you get good at something or at like, not good, but once you get adept at something, then your your mind stops being just hyper focused on that and like okay am I doing this right am I am I moving my hands right like whatever it is and then your mind just wanders my mind just wanders and if I'm just doing the same thing over and over I'm like man I could just be a robot like this is no fun definitely you know in one day yeah, yeah. <laughs> but the um, the stories that you shared about like going to this cadaver lab um, going to see a, a you know a dentist and like these real life opportunities to learn. Um, that's pretty satisfying. Yeah, that's that's yeah. those days. I definitely feel like I have a little kid dream job for sure. <laughs> yeah, that's great. So um, one of the questions that we ask a lot of the creative people is if you now or if you've ever had to like have another gig in order to support this job or if this kind of like just started for you as a new career move and you were just able to like fly into it. Uh, so I, I had kind of a fairy tale finding of my job. I had I came here for school and immediately upon graduation, I moved to Portland and Portland, Oregon. And that was in 2008, like when the economic downturn went on. So I think there was 26 or 28 percent unemployment when I lived out there. So I went to work for a company that contracted for FedEx and was a millwright. So we just went and built FedEx facilities. And I did that out there for a couple of years, couple of years. And then I got laid off for a while. And when, as soon as I moved back to Denver, I ran into an old classmate of mine when I was at a motorcycle shop buying some parts for my bike. And he was working on this motorcycle project that I was part of with all these guys. And I just kind of flip it and like, oh yeah, I'm back in town. If you guys need help on all that, let me know. Mm -hmm. And um, I was looking at going back to work at Illegal Pete's making burritos just to keep the lights on, you know, and I got that job. So I just, it, it came at just the right time. And I've definitely done other stuff while I've been working before. Um, and it's, you know, it's just what you got to do to support whatever lifestyle you feel like you need to have. I'm kind of a dirt bag and can squeeze a pretty thin dime. So I don't need a lot of money. I also, I'm not, I don't have a reward system in my soul that like, oh, the more money I get, the better I'm doing. You know, I like, I like to be able to sleep at night. And that's why I like all the projects we've done that were like the wheelchair project and the, the water project. Like those feel really good because we get to help people out actually. Yeah. You know, I could certainly make way more money doing defense contract stuff, but I don't really want to make things that kill people on purpose. Right. So, um, yeah. Well, and the creative constraints that you're dealing with, like I'm sure just like for the water project, having to keep it at 275. Um, yeah, that's a that's like a big creativity um, challenge. But it's nice having guardrails, too. I mean, being a creative person, if someone's like, oh, just do whatever you want. Oh, yeah. My socks off. I'm like, well. It, and I can do anything. Is it pottery? I'm like, yeah. do you have a sculpture? like, what do you want? You know, so having, having like, I, I feel like I'm a fairly creative person, but when someone just tells like, do whatever you want, I just, I close off. Like, I, 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 I don't relate. know what to do. Yeah. Like, give me at least like one bumper to hit, to bounce off of, you know. Awesome. Um, I have just one or two more. Okay. Um, so one of these questions I really like is who are your influences? Ooh, in what regard? As uh, for design, mostly or anything that kind of, I think mostly for design. But if you can think of something that relates, that's good. Too. So my design influences, I I really like all the the uh, streamline era designers. So that's you know pre forties, but after the twenties, they there's like that's when that's when industrial design like really came into its own and was a term that more and more people knew. Norman Bell Geddes, Raymond Lowy. All the all the brawn product line from the 70s is great. Um, a lot of the new stuff that is coming out, like motorcycle design, is a great example. Everybody's really into all kinds of like multi-planar surfaces right now. They all kind of look like B2 stealth bombers, like they're supposed to be radar proof. And that it kind of just looks like uh, graphic art tessellation. Not really super into that, but and I, I don't really have any designers that I just like. Oh man, you know. Philip Stark is great, but I don't I don't like seek out his stuff all the time, you know, mm -hmm. intentionally. Um, I 
we kid around at work and call the call, we call Google the the idea generator. Yeah. And it's you know you got to be connected and see what's been done and what's out there. And I, that's why I like looking at older stuff because I see what people have already done. I don't like to look at contemporary stuff as much until I'm in a project because I don't want that to kind of pollute what I'm thinking of. Um, you know, there there is contemporary design language, and if you're not careful, you can look dated real quick, especially with the advent of social media and how much you know you pop your phone up and like, oh, this this just hit market yesterday versus nice. you know ten years ago it took a couple of months to a couple of years to see new design trends emerging, and now you know if you follow Design Bloom or some of the the bigger uh, Instagram pages, you know that like there's a design firm called Kiska and they do all the styling for KTM. And their stuff is always great. They do great color work. They do great surfacing. Um, and you can see that right away, like the day stuff drops or even even when they're showing uh, prototypes. But uh, that I think that can negatively impact your, your design language within yourself. Great. Um, yeah, no, I agree. I'm a graphic designer. So, yeah, I yeah. understand what you're yeah, saying. Yeah, you see, like, you know, what was it five years ago? It was like cream brown and blue like that was like the great color yeah. combo yeah. and then it, all of a sudden it's just on everything and it's like okay well that's gross yeah and that's you know that's what's what i was talking about with the multi-planar surfaces like it's the same thing like oh that's cool and then it just got ran into the dirt right and, and it just flips pretty quick yeah and it's yeah. like okay well that's i want something else now <laughs> um so let's see what is a good close uh question here because um i mean you got some really good and if you feel like ask maybe maybe Sue here has a question too. Yeah, if anyone yeah. has a question, please. Uh, I was actually going to ask you. So, <clears throat> obviously, ID is multidisciplinary, and you came at it prior to that. We've been through a lot of disciplines, but what specifically was hard in pivoting into industrial design? Like, what did you feel like you had to like master the competency for? What was challenging? Sitting still. Huh? Sitting <laughs> still, like sitting sitting and doing SolidWorks and getting getting to the point with SOLIDWORKS where I can tell it what to do instead of just designing within the constraints that it pushes at me. Um, that's, I have, I still struggle with it. Like I'm sitting here bouncing and really trying not to fidget, but I, 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 yeah, sitting still, sitting down sketching where you got to crank out, you know, 50 concepts in an hour or something like that. Like I have that, like that pinpoint focus difficulty, but if I'm, if I'm doing handwork and working on stuff and moving, I feel I feel just fine, but like I just sit there and then I don't feel like I'm working. And that's just from that's from doing construction and, and all the stuff I did for a living before going to school. But that was that was one of my hardest things in school. Really talking in front of people is like pulling fingernails for me. <laughs> so, sorry if I'm saying um and mumbling a bunch, but that's that was that was a tough thing in school too, was when you gotta get up and present and then defend your ideas because you know you can just draw like oh yeah i just like i like that shape well what, why do you like that shape you know digging into that um that was difficult too rather than just like immediate like for brain like oh yeah that looks cool that's why you know um and then actually one more yeah i think messed up the last okay i had it oh well maybe you'll come back to you um, we don't do soft goods no. No. um we've been approached about it but we've got uh there's some guys in town that we're buddies with that have their own soft goods outfit so we usually just push stuff their way yeah uh and and then vice versa if they get hit with hard goods they'll come at us we've we've talked about getting into it and all of us are excited to get after it it's just we gotta you know it's got to be the right project so that we're not you know, learning on a client's dime because it's, you know, obviously if you talk about soft goods, they're they're quite a bit different, like the way you do tech pack versus control drawings yeah. and all that. So it's it's just not something that we've all honed ourselves. In. Hello. Uh, so you were talking about how you were first generation graduation, going to college and everything like that, and you went to community college to get your associates of psychology mm -hmm. um how did that whole transition happen like like your level of bike and stuff like that like you personally how hard was it for you to like okay well let me figure out something that i want to do rather than like my parents having that whole like idea like oh go to college do this this is this because me personally i was in the same boat like 
I was going to get my associate of psychology and become a psychologist and become a therapist for, because of my parents, because they were immigrant parents. I mean, my parents are immigrants with this whole idea and the whole pressure that they like really made me think of like, well, do I want to go to school because they're telling me or do I want to become this person or do I want to become this person because I want to be this person? I don't know if that makes any sense. Yeah, so it was, so, you know, my, my folks just wanted me to go to school because, like, my dad's an electrician, um, and he he was always outside and in crawl spaces and working hard, and he just always said, like, man, I want you to, I want you to do better than I did, and I want you to, and, and his generation, that's, that's going to college. I have so many friends that are my age that are plumbers and electricians, and they make way more money than me, and they have zero student debt. Uh, I wish I wouldn't have been such a turd when I was a kid and, and gone to work with my dad a few days because I like what he does is is great. I wanted to go to school for myself because I like learning when I'm engaged. High school is just torture, but like once you get to college, it's like oh man, there's there's so much to do. Um, and then yeah, so I got my my associates in psychology and I worked for two years in that field before I went further because like well I'm going to have to probably get a PhD to do anything, and so I wanted to check it out and I the job that I had really hurt my soul, like dealing, dealing with what I, with j just seeing what the people, my clients were dealing with was, is I couldn't, I couldn't separate that from, from life. Um, so that's, I got out of that and started just doing jobs. And then, um, when I finally decided to go back to school, it was, it was a completely different experience because I, I really wanted to go and I had wanted to pursue psychology, but I just didn't, I mean, I was right out of high school. I just really didn't know much else you know and then so when i went back to school in my in my 20s i was like oh, i got a full-time job i'm doing a full load of, of classes i'm not living in the dorms and like i still have free time you know and it just because i was just like eating it all up and really really wanting to do it um so i don't know if that answers your question yeah, okay yeah. <laughs> thank you can direct sorry <laughs> that's okay Used to being in charge. <laughs> I, I'm just sitting with the question. I'm like, yes, <laughs> you did it because uh, you had to. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about like, the time span for each of the projects and like, the, the process that you went through in, in that amount of time. Sure. So, um, the, uh, so the, the Lucy project, that is still ongoing because when they, when they have new needs, they get a hold of us. Like if there's some industrial design assets we can give them. Uh, that project was already funded so that was great they knew they had a budget that they could work within and, and we like we gave them a price and you know kind of met in the middle in there but that was probably a, I think it's been a three-year effort to this point uh, to get it to where they got to go to market was about two years um, and a lot of that was just waiting for them to get access to another brand of mobility chair that we could get in and because we wanted to make that plate so that all you had to do is bolt it on there and a lot of those chairs use the same base so we we figured that out after getting three or four different ones of them but that was that was that's a that's about the the longevity of projects with us usually is two to three years typically clients will come in and if they if they engage us for industrial design assets like a lot of times companies will come in and they, they know they need to go get funding so they they got to do proof of concept so what they really do is we give them a whole bunch of concepts and then they pick like the top three or four that they like and then we do some really really nice renderings of those do some um, environmental shots and stuff with them and then they take those like they take that as part of their pitch deck and they go to an investor and they say hey i got this this great new mousetrap it's going to you know take care of everything and then that way they get funding and then they come back and we're like all right so we like these three concepts now let's do like risk feasibility and, and kind of and dive into it so there's there's like Funding rounds, so it's really nice when people come in funded because they just know what they have to work with until they get to manufacturing. Because everybody thinks like once your product's designed, then it's just time to start counting money. But then you got to get it manufactured and marketed and all that. Um, the Gorilla Gravity project wasn't even a, I don't think it was even a year. Um, and when when they came to us, it was it was just for industrial design assets. And then they realized that we were actually more useful than just pretty drawings. So we, we actually wound up doing all the surface modeling for their, their molds that they use to actually make the bikes. So really, yeah, around two years is, is pretty common. Um, every once in a while we get some quick turn ones, but the, the stuff that is 
achievable quickly. Most people can find those assets with freelancers and kind of do it on the side. Cause there's a lot of, a lot of people that come in with a project that they've got a, a day job or they've, you know, they're, they're serial entrepreneurs and they get a business going doing well and they sell it and then they ruin their lives and move on to the next thing that they pull their hair out trying to figure out and they get it going great and then they sell it and move again. Um, and I, I don't understand that mindset, but um, I guess maybe that's because I never had a successful business on my own. But yeah, so it's around right about two years, pretty simple. And then just ask me again. Uh, so the kind of fabrication slash designer role that you take, uh, first off, is that kind of more because you guys have this smaller shop and you have this in-house operation, you do that kind of thing. And then also, is everybody else on the design team do the same thing, or is there like somebody who is doing more sketching? Somebody who is so, all just doing, you know? yeah. So I'm I'm definitely the the most shop capable at our spot, um, and we we make a point to keep as much prototyping in house as we can, because a lot of a lot of other firms, and typically they're larger firms, um, they send that stuff out. They pay a prototype shop in China to machine parts or to make a quick like mud mold for injection molding and bring it back in. Um, you know, we don't have an injection molder, but we do have CNC machine and, and mills and lays and welders. So that helps us work faster because we're not waiting on something to come, come overseas or even just from up the street. So we got into that because there was a, a motorcycle project in town that I worked with all these guys on called uh, Ronin Motor Works. We did, we did all those bikes. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but we learned in doing that that to be successful, you got to control your own destiny. And so I already had some hand skills with stuff regard to, you know, what we're doing on those motorcycles. And then we just kept taking more and more and more on. And then when we opened our doors, being link, like get, get being shut of that motorcycle project, it was like, OK, well, I'm I'm definitely more shop capable. Like I said, I have a hard time sitting down and, and like doing all the solid work stuff. So one of the other guys that works with us is a solid works master. He can he can do anything super quick. Um, he's, he's also a great renderer, a great sketcher. The other, our other industrial designer is a good renderer and sketcher. And he's, he, he had a mechanical engineering pathway before he decided he didn't want to be an engineer and he stopped and then like switched to industrial design. So he's real good because he's got a, a real good gut mechanically for if wall thicknesses are right or something is, you know, oh, you got, you got, you got too big of a lever arm on that. It's going to just break. And all of us have have that like pretty well innately because the first thing we worry about is if something is, is buildable like that's something we see in portfolios a lot because we go to portfolio review and we'll see kids you know and they got their whole body of work that they're exhibiting for the evening and it's like oh yeah i got like this thing is a pedometer and it counts your calories and it's got wi-fi connectivity and it does this and does that and they're like well Where's all that live? Like that thing's not big enough to have all that in there. Mm -hmm. So, which is, you know, that's people that don't know any better is what pushes uh, manufacturing processes and design. Like, well, it has to be this size. And then, so that makes a circuit board person figure out how to shrink all that stuff down. And, and, uh, and that, that all drives everything. So it's not necessarily a bad thing, but it's definitely something that, that we look at uh, when, when we're looking at people. And, and even with our engineers, like, that we have three engineers and they're all mechanical engineers at the shop, but some of them are better at doing the finite elemental analysis. So, so checking to see if parts are going to break or if they're, if they're going to have blowouts during uh, injection molding or have cold shots when they're getting molded. And then we have other engineers that are better at the procurement side of things. Like they're really good at like, oh, we got it. Like we're trying to source all these parts to build this thing. I know this weird place in Iowa that, that'll make custom ball bearings for me or any of that. So there's definitely specific like niche skills that each one of us have. But for the most part, like if somebody's out sick or, you know, puts themselves in the hospital mountain biking or whatever, one of us can pivot and take over what they're doing once we get back up to speed on the job. Cool. So we've gone over a little bit. So maybe this time. Okay. I have a lot more questions, but <laughs> quite another time to ask. Yeah, I'll, I'll answer great. questions all the time. This is way better than just talking about myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, thank you for being here. Yeah, this is really good. Yeah. Great. <laughs> all right. Really interesting. So, yeah. Cool. I'm glad, you, yeah. glad you all enjoyed it. Even if you don't like it, you're pretty good at it. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> cool. All right. I'm going to take this.